So, this is an article written by David Lewis responding to Van Inwagen's uh, consequence argument for incompatibilism. So, as such, it is a defense of compatibilism, which is the idea that both determinism, uh, the idea that if you knew a complete state of the universe plus all the laws of physics at any moment in history, you could um, work out the exact state of the universe at any other point in history because it would have to be a certain way according to the laws and the, the initial state that you know. That's determinism. That appears incompatible with the idea that we have free will, uh, where if you think of free will as an ability to do other than what we in fact do. Uh, and the consequence argument is a very clear presentation of this, um, of this incompatibility. It's, a, its conclusion is that we, if determinism is true, we don't have free will. Now, David Lewis is unquestionably one of the great uh, American philosophers, or indeed philosophers of any nationality, of the second half of the 20th century. Um, you know, it's basically him and Kripke in, uh, um, in the fields that they do. And Kripke, uh, while perhaps naming a necessity was more, um, was more of a sort of explosion and convinced more people, David Lewis published on much more things um, and had opinions on all kinds of things. Uh, in the next unit, we're going to be looking at Lewis's view about possible worlds, which of course was, uh, Kripke also wrote on, and they had a, a pretty significant disagreement about possible worlds. That's probably what Lewis is most famous for, but he also made huge contributions into um, theories about uh, causation and also about convention in language, all kinds of things. So, he was a very creative and original thinker, and he could write very clearly uh, at a level that undergraduates can understand, but he could also do the incredibly complicated formal stuff. He could write a paper that, you know, was all logical notation. Um, so, a, an all-rounder. Apparently very shy, very nice man, uh, had, grew his beard in sort of uh, two strands. It grew long and straggly and they were separate strands. Uh, loved trains. He loved trains. He, was, um, he loved Australia uh, in part because they had wonderful trains and he visited Australia basically every, every time it was winter here and summer there for, for much of his uh, adult life. Uh, he was a diabetic, which that eventually killed him. Um, he was found dead by his wife uh, after, after she'd have been, been away for the weekend and he just didn't control his diet. Tragic loss for philosophy, but he, would, he had already um, written a good deal by that point. This article is probably not um, one of his most famous in terms of original contributions. But Van Ingwagen regarded it as perhaps the best response to the, um, the consequence argument. And it was published fairly soon after uh, Van Ingwagen's original article. And it didn't make as much of an impact as uh, both Van Ingwagen and other writers think that it should have done. And part of that might be because uh, people thought that in order for it to work, you have to be committed to other of David Lewis's positions, such as his views on counterfactuals and possible worlds. And the general consensus now is that you don't, and that actually it is a fairly devastating response to the consequence argument. Although, it's pretty hard to follow if you read this article. It's written in fairly plain English, English, and he kind of repeats the point again and again, but it's a hard point to get your head round. Um, and even when you do, 
it seems a little bit unsatisfying, so I will do the best that I can to make sense of it. Um, I'll read a couple of passages. One is uh, a sort of statement of credo by David Lewis. He says, I have just put my hand down on my desk. That, let me claim, was a free but predetermined act. Free in that I was able to act otherwise. So here, uh, just as Van Inwagen defines it, free will is in terms of having an ability. So in laying his hand down on his desk, he was free because he was able to act otherwise. For instance, to raise my hand. But there is a true historical proposition, H, this is uh, exactly as Van Inwagen puts it, about the intrinsic state of the world long ago. And there is a true proposition, L, specifying the laws of nature that govern our world, such, as, such that H and L, you combine the, uh, the complete snapshot of the universe uh, hundreds of years ago with the laws of nature, they, such that H and L jointly determine what I did. So if you knew the complete state of the universe, if you were like God, or uh, as the mathematician Laplace put it, an omniscient demon, if you knew the complete state of the universe at, you know, I don't know, the time of the dinosaurs uh, and the laws of nature, then you could calculate exactly and know that David Lewis would put his hand on the desk, had to put his hand on the desk, you might say, uh, at the time that he did. So, I'll read it again. There is a true historical proposition H about the intrinsic state of the world long ago, and there is a true proposition L specifying the laws of nature that govern our world such that H and L jointly determine what I did. They jointly imply the proposition that I put my hand down. They jointly contradict the proposition that I raised my hand. Yet I was free. I was able to raise my hand. The way in which I was determined not to was not the sort of way that counts as inability. So that's his view. Nice, uh, you know, that should be a hook because you want to know, wait a minute, if I, if I am determined to keep my hand down, how is it that I have an ability to raise my hand? Um, as uh, another way uh, he puts it is, in short, as a feigned soft determinist. Remember, a soft determinist is somebody who believes that determinism is true and we are free. Lewis himself is not a soft determinism because he's uh, uncommitted about determinism, but he, he thinks that soft determinism could be true. So therefore, he is in that sense a compatibilism, that determinism and free will could be true together. So he says, that's why he says a feigned soft determinism. For the sake of this article, I'm going to defend soft determinism. As a feigned soft determinism who accepts the requisite auxiliary pr premises and principles of logic, I am committed to the consequence that if I had done what I was able to do, raise my hand, then some law would be broken. Okay. So the consequence argument implies that uh, uh, the way that uh, Van Inwagen put it is if determinism is true, then if I did, if I was able to do otherwise than I in fact, than determinism said I would, then this implies that I am able to break the laws. Um, now, what uh, Lewis is saying is, uh, note carefully what he says. I, here's what I believe, I, Lewis, believe. If I had done what I was able to do, raise my hand, he, remember, he didn't raise his hand, and determinism determined that he would not raise his hand, but he says that if I had done what I was able to do, then some law would have been broken. Now, this is very carefully worded. Um, this is the humorous part. That is to say, my opponent paraphrases, you claim to be able to break the very laws of nature and with so little effort, a marvelous power indeed. Can you also bend spoons? Uh, this kind of dates the article because around that time there was this Israeli 
uh, mentalist called Yuri Geller, who was all over, uh, you know, a, a, a famous public figure, kind of like Evil Knievel was back in the 70s, who would go on TV shows and he would get a spoon and he would look at it, you know, squint it and say, bend, bend, rubbing it very gently between thumb and finger, and it would bend like it was made of rubber. But before that, he would have knocked the, it on the table to show that it was a real metal spoon. So he claimed that he could bend it with his mind. Of course, it was a trick. He had something on his thumb, but uh, that's why he uses the otherwise bizarre question, can you also bend spoons? Because, you know, it sounds like, whoa, you have magic powers like Yuri Geller. So in that response, the difference between the two things I read the, uh, his opponent, who he says I've modeled on Vin Van Inwagen, is saying, oh, you're claiming you're able, you are able to break the laws of physics. And, but very carefully, David Lewis says, no, I'm able to do something, specifically raise my hand, such that if I did do it, a law of physics would be broken. Now, what's the difference? Well, that's the point. If you can't grasp the difference, um, then you're not going to get much out of this article. So uh, the key point that uh, the consequence argument gets its strength from, it says, essentially, look, if determinism is true, then I had to keep my hand down. Uh, as, yeah, actually, let's read Van, read David Lewis's summary of, of the consequence argument, because uh, he puts it quite nicely. Van Inwagen's argument runs as follows near enough. I recast it as a reductio against the instance of soft determinism that I feign to uphold. Okay, a reductio is where, uh, it's, that's short for reductio ad absurdum. You assume something is false and show you assume that the person's con uh, conclusion is false, and then you uh, show that it leads to a contradiction. Um, so he says, I did not raise my hand. Suppose for reductio that I could have raised my hand, although determinism is true. So let's pretend that I could have. And uh, the way a reductio works is um, you assume something that you claim can't happen, and then you show that uh, assuming that leads to a contradiction. The contradiction can't be true, so therefore what you assume can't be true, because what you assume implied a contradiction. So let's see how it goes. I did not raise my hand. Suppose for reductio that I could have raised my hand, though determinism is true. Then it follows, given four premises that I cannot question, these are in the original, which we talked about in our video on Van Inwagen. Um, the conjunction HL of a certain historical proposition H about the state of the world before my birth and a certain law proposition L. If so, then I could have rendered L false. I could have made it false, made the, the uh, description of the law of physics false and in a, friend, in a sense broken a law of physics. But, but, says uh, Van Inwagen's article, I could not have rendered it false, therefore uh, this refutes our supposition that I could have raised my hand because it leads to both that I could have rendered it false and I couldn't. Therefore, it's a contradiction, so I couldn't have raised my hand. Now, um, what uh, Lewis points out is the intuitive appeal of uh, Van Inwagen's argument is it says, in order to be free... If determinism is true, in order to be free, I have to have a literally incredible, in the sense of being unbelievable, couldn't happen, power. I have to be able to, by my very action, break a law of physics. Like a law of physics is holding me back like a chain, and I raise my hand and snap it. Nobody believes that we have such ability. So if the argument is right, and in order to be free, I have... Uh, being free requires this incredible power under determinism, then obviously I'm not free under determinism. Where the argument goes wrong, according to Lewis, is in saying that in order to be free, or f being free requires that you have this incredible power, being free if determinism is true. 
Whereas what Lewis says, no, that's not actually true. Com compatibilism only requires that I have this kind of power in order to be free under determinism. Um, and that is not an incredible power. That is a perfectly normal power. I am able to do something. So the, the strong thesis says that in order to be free, I am, it requires that I am able to break a law. And we all agree, says Lewis says, yes, that's right. We don't have that. So if the argument is right and that's required for freedom, then obviously we're not free. But in fact, all it requires is that I have this power, and that's exactly the kind of power that Lewis says I have under determinism. I am able to do something. What is the something? I am able to raise my hand such that if I did it, a law of physics would be broken. What's the difference? The difference is it's not my hand raising that breaks the law of physics. Notice it says would be broken. It doesn't say by me. So, according to Lewis, even though determinism determines everything that I do, and, I, uh, and so including keeping my hand on the desk in his example, nonetheless, I have the ability to raise my hand. What, how do I have this ability? I have the ability to do something. Now, now what does this ability require? Well, if determinism is true, it requires that the laws of physics be different from how they in fact are. So, in other words, uh, it would go against L. It would deny L. L being the description of the laws of physics as known at this time before I'm born uh, in the original example. So, if I do raise my hand, then it turns out that L is false. What that means is that the laws of physics are actually different from described in L, because if they're the same as described in L, then my hand has to be down. So if I raise my hand, they must be different. Now, it's not my raising my hand that makes them different. In fact, it's, uh, the causal relationship, if there is one, is the other way around. My raising my hand is, a, again, because of determinism. I raise my hand because this new description of the laws of physics, different from L, call them L1, determined that I would raise my hand. But, so, in other words, the laws would be different if I raised my hand. And that's what determinism, is uh, uh, determinism says. Now, you can see why an, uh, most incompatibilists would find this um, and, you know, unpersuasive. Because what is Lewis saying? It, it, he's not saying that I can raise my hand and thereby change the laws of physics. He's saying, I have the ability to raise my hand. If I raised my hand, what that would mean is that the laws had changed. Not by my raising my hand, by, as he puts it, some kind of minor miracle. This is where um, you have to it's kind of uh, jarring to see him talk about miracles in this article, and you have to read his, his stuff on possible worlds to understand how he defends this kind of talk. But uh, a miracle is just something that goes against the laws of physics. So there would have to be some kind of event that changed the laws of physics or violated the laws of physics in the history of my ra uh, raising my hand. Because if, if that hadn't happened, then L would have determined that I kept my hand down. Um, but it's not my raising my hand that did it. It's the change in effect is what allowed my hand to, ra to, to rise. It's not my raising my hand that, that causes it. So you, might, you can imagine a compatible, uh, an incompatibilist saying, well, wait a minute though. Given that the laws of physics are as they are, um, doesn't that mean that you don't have the ability that you claim? You claim that you have the ability to raise your hand. Uh, how do you have that ability? Well, here's where I think um, the way that you could flesh this out is in talking a bit about possibility. So uh, this is where it, it helps to have a, a little knowledge of 
possible worlds, which we're going to talk about later, um, specifically Lewis's approach to them and, and his critics. But uh, if things are possible, that means there is a possible world in which um, they are true. So uh, if things are not possible, then that means there is no possible world in which they are true. So if you believe that it is not possible for 2 plus 2 to equal 5, what this means is that there's no possible world in which 2 plus 2 equals 5, and most philosophers would say that's true. Now, is there a possible world in which I raise my hand and determinism is true? Absolutely there is. There's a possible world. This, there's the actual world in which, let's assume, determinism is true, and I don't raise my hand. But there's also another world in which determinism is true, and I do raise my hand. Now, there's a key difference between these two worlds, and that's the laws are different. Well, either you can make a choice. You can either say the past was different or the laws were different, because remember, uh, me keeping my hand down is as a result of a, a conjunction of a, a complete description of the world I'm in at a certain point in history plus the laws of physics. Now, there's two things that you could change in order to make it so that in this other possible world I raise my hand. It could be the past could be different or the laws could be different. Lewis is just considering a case where we, we change the laws and we keep the past constant. Okay, so the laws would have to be very slightly different in this other possible world. But is that possible? Sure it is. The laws of physics are what's called contingent. There is no necessity to the, law, the way the laws of the physics are in our world. They just happen to be the way they are. Now, they are the way they are, but they could have been otherwise. How do we know? Because there's other possible worlds in which they're otherwise. So, there is another possible world in which determinism is true, and I raise my hand. So, therefore, I can raise my hand with determinism being true. I have the power to raise my hand. Now, that doesn't mean that in doing so I broke the laws. No, the laws were just different, not because of anything I did. In fact, it's, as I said, it's the other way around. I am able to raise my hand because the laws are different. So in raising my hand, I do not break the laws. So the answer to this is, no, we're not free to break the laws. But we are free, and we're free despite the consequence argument. So. Um, uh, a contemporary philosopher who uh, I actually know, Kadri Vivalin at USC, who's written a book um, on a similar, uh, defending a position similar to David Lewis's, summarizes it this way. The compatibilist is committed only to saying that if determinism is true, we have abilities which we would exercise only if the past and the, or the laws had been different in the appropriate ways. And while this may sound odd, it is no more incredible than the claim that the successful exercise of our abilities depends not only on us, but also on the cooperation of factors outside our control. For any free action you do, you can only do it if the laws cooperate. So, um, you know, I can only raise my hand in normal circumstances if uh, gravity is not so strong that my hand is just pulled downwards. That, that gravity has to be such that uh, my muscles can lift my hand. So, um, while this may sound odd, it's no more incredible than the claim that the successful exercise of our abilities depends not only on us, but on the cooperation of factors outside our control. Since we are neither superheroes nor gods, we are always in this position, regardless of the truth or falsity of determinism. So, that is what uh, Lewis defends. So Lewis's position is a compatibilist view that accepts the, the, uh, the description of free will as requiring the ability to do otherwise. Remember, some compatibilists say, no, free will doesn't require that. Sort of simple, classic, basic compatibilism says, no, free will doesn't require the ability to do otherwise. It just requires being able to do what you want. Uh, but that seems unsatisfactory for various reasons. Whereas this version of compatibilism that Lewis is defending says, you're right, in order to be free, it has to be the case that for anything I do, I could have not done that. I have that ability. I am able to do something uh, such that I, I have the ability 
to do other than I in fact do. Now, uh, if I did do other than in fact, uh, uh, then if I did do other than what I in fact do, then the laws of physics would be broken. Now, probably better would be to say different. Uh, the laws of physics would be different. Um, does that mean I couldn't? Not in the sense of could that uh, we understand when we use possible worlds. Is something possible? If it happens in a possible world, it is possible. Is there a possible world in which determinism is true and I raise my hand? Yes. So therefore, I have that ability. I, it is possible that I can raise my hand, even though, in fact, in the actual world, you might say, I had to keep my hand down. Now, if that seems unsatisfactory, well, it sounds like you have incompatibilist intuitions. But Van Enwagen regarded this as uh, a pretty devastating response to his argument. That doesn't mean the argument is dead. Different people have given different versions of it. He keeps working on the argument himself. But uh, he himself regarded this response by Lewis as very powerful. So there you go.